So I say good morning to our Californian friends. Uh, it's nine o'clock, I believe, in, in, uh, in Los Angeles. And, and good evening to our Swedish friends here, uh, letting in some more. Um, I'll hand over to Chandler and Thomas from White Bear and take it away, guys. Sure, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. We're excited to present this panel to you. I'm going to introduce our panelists briefly and then turn it over to Thomas to launch us into our first question for the Q&A. With us today, we have Yvette uh, Metoyer. Uh, she is a music supervisor from Southern California. She originally was working with music, Super Music Vision when I first met her, uh, working on incredible shows like Breaking Bad, The Walking Dead, and so many more. Um, she also is a member of the Black Women in Media Collective, uh, raising visibility for Black women in creative media. And in July 2020, she decided to take the reins and develop her own music supervision company, Sounds in Color. So please welcome Yvette. With her, <laughs> we have Arbel Vidak, um, a music creative who's worked in sync publishing and composer representation. Uh, he used to be with Evolution Music Partners as a composer agent and then at DECA Publishing, working in sync and publishing. He's represented and collaborated with composers like uh, Abel Ko, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get his horrible name wrong, the Polish composer who did Single Kozanowski. Man. <laughs> Kozanowski, thank you. Leslie Barber, Phil Eisler, Clint Mansell, Max Richter, Alex Summers, and so many more. Um, and Arbel just recently launched his own creative agency um, this month, in fact. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much for joining us. Please welcome Arbel Bedak. And hey, everybody. My name is Thomas Mikus. I'm with White Bear PR. And uh, I want to kick it off right away. I know you could talk about that quite a bit. But if you could briefly explain what does a sync agent do and what does a music supervisor do? And especially for music supervisor, because my understanding is the role of a music supervisor here in the United States is a bit different to maybe a music supervisor in the UK or on, in, in, in Europe. So Yvette, if you want to start maybe. Sure, um, there's a lot of facets to, to music supervision. You know, I think the most popular idea of what we do is, you know, going into our library and, and selecting music to pitch for different scenes and <clears throat> in, in projects. And that, that is correct, it's, it's correct. Um, however, you know, our responsibility also includes negotiating licenses uh, and license fees with copyright holders. Um, so we're, we're, you know, regularly in contact with uh, record labels, uh, music publishers, independent licensing companies. Um, to negotiate deals uh, to get uh, music placements um, for, for our projects. Um, secondly, you know, we have a, a really um, strong connection with the producers of TV shows as well as directors of films. Um, you have some folks that specialize in film projects, some, some uh, music supervisors who specialize in television. There's also music supervisors who solely work on uh, video games um, advertisement and uh, and trailers. So there's there's multifaceted um, responsibilities for for music supervision. Uh, we work very closely with directors and producers to fulfill their vision. Ultimately, it's their vision that is what you see on screen. And our job is to find the music that helps to tell that story to fulfill their vision. And, and uh, there's often um, times where we're also part of the conversation for um, hiring composers. Uh, we, we sometimes will be involved in that conversation too, where we might recommend, you know, a, a collection of composers who might be a good fit for a particular show, especially if it's a pilot, uh, which is the very first episode. Um, that's kind of a, a test episode to see if a, a network will want to pick it up, you know, for a full series. So we're involved in quite a bit of the creative process as well as the business process uh, as far as music placements go. Thank you, Yvette. Um, Abel, can you talk a bit about your role and about uh, the role of a sync agent, please? Yeah, so, um, so a sync agent, or sometimes just called a sync rep, um, like representative, um, 
essentially, you know, is representing music to be placed um, in any kind of media, film, TV, advertising, trailers, video games. Nowadays, there's a lot more even podcasts, like, you know, any anywhere that needs music licensed. Um, you know, most uh, sort of major and even indie publishers and labels may have like an internal sync team, but people who are a little more independent or maybe individual artists or composers um, who want to have their music represented for licensing will usually seek out someone um, who's a sync agent and basically has a company um, that is just signing deals, um, signing music to represent. Um, so, you know, uh, some people will special, some sync agents will specialize in specific genres of music. Some might have stronger relationships in specific media or specific areas. Um, part of the job is really like building relationships um, with people like Yvette, mostly with music supervisors and all kinds of other creatives. Um, so uh, typically sort of um, what we'll be doing is, is you know, letting music supervisors know what kind of music we're representing, what kind of artists or composers we're representing and basically trying to build some trust there so that they're send, reaching out when they have projects coming up that need specific music um, and will then pitch that music. Um, so uh, for the most part, usually I would say like sync agents are really like representing music, not necessarily owning it, but there's a lot of different types of structures in that in this area so it really kind of depends on on the rep or on the agency and like how they're kind of setting up their business um but usually they'll also like certain people or certain agencies will like um kind of specialize in specific genre spaces so it's always good to to do some research and see you know if you're looking for representation like who's the right fit for your music uh, a question for you both. Um, Arbel, I know your work at DECA Publishing involved uh, work in the UK as well. And Yvette, I'm not sure about your experience working out of Europe, but what are some differences working on American-based projects and European-based projects? And do you deal, are there any sort of differences in uh, dealing with American you know, publishers or European publishers or, or, or representatives and stuff like that? Is there anything you can point out about the differences? Um, or do you wanna go first to that? Yeah, go for it. Oh, okay, um, I guess from the representation side, um, actually prior to DECA Publishing, I kind of worked internationally a bit more with DECA Publishing. I was handling North America because I had um, a counterpart who was out of London and working more of like Europe and, and the UK and some of the rest of the world. But um, I would say, um, I think there may be like two main differences. One is just the structure for how things work. So uh as far as like music supervision in the u.s there tend to be a lot more music supervisors that work in-house uh basically like hired by a company working at like trailer houses for film trailers or at advertising agencies um whereas uh especially like in the uk but i think really throughout europe um there tend to be like music music houses and so a company will hire a music house um, to basically serve as like the music supervisor and do music supervision for specific projects, or sometimes it might just be their go-to for most things. But um, on that end, they tend to be kind of a separate um, entity, which is actually very helpful because you could be working with a music supervision house or music company that's working with multiple companies. So by pitching to one person, you're potentially getting your music out there for multiple projects. Whereas here, if you're pitching to an in-house music supervisor or music producer at let's say an ad agency, obviously they're only gonna be working on projects that that ad agency is working on. Um, and then the other thing I would say, and, and this also, and I know we'll probably get into it, um, talking about um, the state of things during the pandemic, but um, pre-pandemic at least, uh, I would say probably also the fees is probably one of the bigger differences. I think there tends to be a bit better fees, like higher money for licensing in the U.S. It all obviously depends on um, the project and 
and everything. There's, you know, obviously an array of, of fees and pricing, but I think that for similar projects, a lot of times they'll, there would be a bit more money in the US. I don't know if that'll be the case continuing forward, but um, we'll see. Yeah, I, you know, I would say most of my experience has been with productions, you know, that are based um, here in the States. Um, and generally, you know, we'll, we'll source music from several different companies. So, you know, uh, like Arbel for, for an example, um, you know, I'll do kind of a general reach out um, if, if I'm looking for something in particular and I'll, I will ask folks to, to um, share music with me based upon the parameters of what I'm looking for. Um, I would say as far as the licensing process goes, it's pretty similar. I, I would imagine, you know, working with a European company um, as it would be here in the States. Uh, and then, you know, dealing with the major companies, you know, um, major labels and publishers, there's usually um, a local office here uh, in the States that I interact with, and then they engage with their, their European counterparts. So for me to, to really have a distinction between, you know, the two, um, I don't really have a strong answer for that. I, you know, I would certainly work with folks, you know, from, from several different countries, from, from wherever. Um, and um, I don't think that there's any sort of difficulty. I would imagine that, yes, the fees that we have to work with here in the States um, probably might be a little bit higher than, than elsewhere. Um, I think the only thing, the only hurdle that I've come up against was dealing with some of the European PROs uh, uh, as it relates to rights language in the quote requests that the studios, their, their templates that they, they include. And um, I'm trying to think, I think it was Sassem, if I'm not mistaken, it was a French, French PRO. And there were some, they were uh, clearing publishing um, for a particular song. And uh, there was some pushback regarding uh, rights language that was in the template that I was using that was provided by the studio. And so there was no, no wiggle room because the studio said, well, this is standard. And, um, you know, most, most uh, companies are in agreement with it. And versus the PRO, they, you know, were steadfast and they said, well, we can't we just are, we just can't accept it. So unfortunately, I, I did have to move on, you know, from that particular song. Um, but I would say that's probably the, the biggest difference that I've I've had, ex, you know, uh, an experience with lately. I would say in the last uh, four or five months or so. Otherwise, I, I don't see much of a big difference. I don't think. I think also just one more thing that popped in my head is um, moral rights. It's something that we don't really have in the U.S. And so it has to be waived anytime you're really doing anything in the U.S. But it is something that exists, I believe, all through Europe. But I'm not sure if it's like a European Union thing or if it's specific countries. Um, but yeah, I don't know if everyone knows what moral rights are. But basically, in a lot of Europe, you as the writer actually have, regardless of whether you, I believe, regardless of whether you actually have own, like publishing ownership over the music or anything like that, you still have moral rights, which means that you actually can still like approve or deny the use of something. And that's not something that we have in the US. So uh, I think because of the international market, usually there'll actually be some wording in a license um, or even in like a composer contract or something um, that'll say you're waiving your moral rights. So that'd probably be a difference. Um, Abel and Yvette, could you give some advice to uh, Swedish songwriters or uh, right holders on the best way to present their music? Uh, you know, should they uh, email you? Should they send you links? Should they uh, do files? How would you like them to organize it? And also, can you talk a bit if the chances of pre-cleared music uh, to 
be seeing if it increases it, if it's pre-cleared, or if it doesn't make a difference for you guys. So whoever wants to take that first. I, um, what's great with working with uh, smaller companies, independent companies, is that there is a reputation that they have. And, you know, their reputation is, is really built on how we work together and, you know, what they, what they provide to us, how likely is it to clear in time, whether or not there's going to be any sort of issues, you know, after the fact or during the clearance process. And so what I appreciate about the, the smaller companies and, and the majors too for, that, for, that, um, for this example is that they do a really good job of vetting their artists uh, and songwriters, meaning if, if there are any samples that are used in work, um, they will, you know, confirm that information, clear it if need be, or, you know, make sure that that song does not get pitched, you know, to us. And so it saves music supervisors, you know, a lot of time. Um, so I, I say that to say it's really, beneficial to align yourself with a, a strong um, music licensing company because they have good relationships with music supervisors and yes you can you can provide your music to one supervisor like let's say for me but I am just one and although I might have you know two projects one or two projects it's still just one or two projects versus aligning yourself with a music licensing company, they have relationships with many music supervisors. So it opens up more opportunities and possibilities for an artist or songwriter to get their music heard and potentially placed in a lot more um, projects. Uh, I, I generally welcome uh, music pitches to me. Uh, I, I would ask that, I think it's very important for um, companies, artists, songwriters, to research who they're reaching out to, to research the projects that they're working on and compare you know, their style of music or compare their, their repertory to, to see if it lines up with the projects that a music supervisor is working on um, and to, to understand that you know, maybe there's a show or a film that a music supervisor has been working on that they're finished you know, and it's been over, you know, finished for, for a year or two. I think it's, it shows a lot when someone reaches out randomly and says, hey, you know, I'm a fan of your work. I'd like to, you know, present some of my music, but then to also know exactly who they're reaching out to. You know, there, there are moments where I will get a blanket email from someone I don't know, I don't have any interaction with, and it's not addressed to me. It just says hi. And you can tell it's just presented to, you know, however many people that are on their email chain. And, you know, it's like, what's the motivation for me to, when I'm receiving hundreds of emails a day, either based upon a need that I have, or just again, companies I have a relationship with, but what's the motivation for me to click on that one email that, that you know, they didn't even take the time to include my name on. So I think it, it does go a long way for, you know, uh, companies to to research music supervisors they want to reach out to go on to IMDb go on to tune find you can kind of get a sense of the type of music that's being uh, uh, used um, and then yes be prepared as far as your, the music that you're submitting um, and, and each music supervisor is different so what I what I will say is generally for myself um, but I do prefer MP3s as opposed to WAVs, you know, and AIFFs only because MP3s do hold metadata. And <clears throat> it's certainly important to have, you know, the, the standard information, you know, the artist name, song title, album, um, all of that information. But the most important is your contact information um, in the metadata of the song because Again, there's, there's a flurry of emails that comes in on a daily basis, and there could be a song that I land on that I absolutely love and I find a potential home, but there is no contact information, and I'm not exactly sure where the music came from. And so, you know, it's hard to kind of go back, you know, I might be able to go back into the email that was sent, but if that person did not include 
the name of the artist, there's no way for me to kind of cross reference to find out, you know, who that song came from. So it's, it's, I'd say the most important thing is to make sure you have your, your company name or artist name and contact information uh, in the metadata. Uh, a lot of folks are, are kind of moving on to Disco, uh, which is a, uh, a web-based um, music uh, uh, holding system. Um, that way you can kind of send and receive music directly from uh, the cloud server. Um, so, and I, I'm fine with that, receiving download links, uh, that works for me. But I, I think, again, just to kind of circle back, it, it's important to, to research who you're sending music to, get a sense of what kind of projects they're working on, and just to make sure that the metadata in your, your music has your contact information. It's super, super important. And I just want to emphasize that because coming from Europe and uh, living in the United States now for 23 years, it's something I had to learn. I think it's, you know, it is the, the conversation and the, the, the personal aspect. And I cannot emphasize how important that is to, to not send mass emails, to really research what Yvette just say, and to really put a point in there, why are you contacting, uh, contacting that sync rep or that music supervisor or that agent or that publicist? Otherwise, it gets lost. And you know, you know, here in America, you really have to make a point why you want to work with that person, why you think it's a good fit, why you want to collaborate. And I think we might not do that as much in Europe. And I really see here, this is beneficial. So I know it saves time to do mass emails but you really have to personalize and research and get to the point why you want to work with that person. It, it really goes a long way, I think. Abel, do yeah. you want to talk a bit about, about uh, a bit about you know how you would, would like people to submit to you and also about pre-clearances? Yeah, I mean, it's a very it's very similar, honestly. Um, you do your research, do your due diligence. Um, like I kind of said earlier. Uh, different companies uh, a lot of times will specialize in various, you know, specific genre spaces, or, you know, you can look at a website, at, at a company's website, and maybe, you know, most companies will highlight placements that they've gotten. Um, so you can maybe look and see where it seems like maybe they're getting a lot of work done. So they clearly like seem to specialize or have good relationships in a specific area. Um, I, you know, I'm now kind of expanding with my new company. I'm expanding a bit on sort of the air on the sync side of the area of music that I'm working in. But, um, most of my career has been very in the sort of film score, neoclassical and some adjacent sort of hybrid areas around that. And, uh, my impression was that that's pretty clear if you look at my LinkedIn or you look at my social media or things like that, um, or if you even just see, let's say I worked at DECA Publishing and you go and you look at the DECA Publishing website, but I would get people sending me messages trying to pitch me, you know, hip hop, rap, rock, like really, really just like straightforward pop and I'm a fan of all those genres of music personally, but it's like, if you looked at what I was doing, it was very clear I'm not working in that space. And so if, if on top of that, you're basically just like, you should listen to my music. I really think it's sync friendly and like things like that. I'm really immediately gonna be kind of like, well, you didn't really put time in to look into what I'm doing. And now I'm taking the time to listen to your music that's clearly not in an area that I work in. So. I can't really put much more time into this as well. So um, yeah, I think it's really about that, again, that personal touch and, and that kind of goes into that as well, you know? So it's like, take the time if you're really trying to find a good partner. And I think also um, it can feel very like, oh, I just need to get my music out there as widely as possible. And like one of these will land and it's a numbers game and stuff. But in that sense, as far as finding representation and I think probably even going into um if you end up pitching directly to like music supervisors it's actually you know not a numbers game in that sense because you want to be getting your music in front of the right people rather than in front of just everyone and hoping that some of them are the right people 
Um, because you also, it's, it's very, uh, yes, someone just said, it's what I was about to say, it's about relationships and, you know, your relationship with a sync agent, similar to if you have a manager or you have uh, a talent agent or, you know, anyone you're putting on your team, a publisher or your label, it's, there should be trust in that relationship. And you can't really like develop trust with someone if you're just kind of blanket sending music out there. Um, so I think, you know, it's worth taking the time to do some research, see who you feel like jumps out at you that fe actually feels like, oh, this is someone I could see like really pushing my music or, oh, they're working on all these, you know, projects that I really feel like my music fits in. And I think also just like being very realistic with yourself, you know, as an artist about where your music is, um, the quality of it, if it's not quite there yet, maybe spend some more time learning about mixing or finding a mixer to work with and getting it to polish to where you feel it's good and then sending it to someone you know like don't there's there's always projects happening so there's no reason to rush or be impatient if you don't feel like your music is quite there yet um and then uh i will say as far as actually sending music first of all i would suggest ask like reaching out initially and asking if you can send music um, I think it's potentially a little, I don't know if it's the same for you, Yvette, um, but, uh, you know, for me, I think, and probably for Yvette as well, I think I'll, everyone who kind of works in music in either representation or as in music supervision, it's like getting lots of music sent all the time. So you do have to be realistic that you're part of a sea of music that's being sent out, um, which is also why I think like for Yvette, for instance, like being able to work with a select number of sync agents or labels or publishers is much easier than even if everyone on this call sent her a link to music right now she'd have like 55 <laughs> links to listen to and like she has work to do <laughs> she can't just sit and listen to all that so i think asking first also for me i really am much more likely to tell someone yeah like shoot me a link i very specifically tell people send me a couple tracks that's a big thing too. A lot of people like to be like, oh, great. Like, here's my entire catalog. And like, what you want to do is maybe select like five, maybe 10 at the most of you, what you feel is like your best tracks, the ones that like are most indicative of, of your style and your ability and your aesthetic and what you're going for and use those be confident in those and let those highlight you and what you ideally want is for someone like me or someone like Yvette to then come back and say send me more you know but if I just get a link that's clearly someone's entire catalog I'm actually not very likely to spend much time listening to it because I don't really know like what I should be listening to and I might listen to the first two tracks and those might not be the first two tracks you wanted me to listen to you know but if I get a playlist of like eight tracks that are clearly in a specific order I'm going to sit and I'm going to go through those tracks because I'm like oh well this person decided that this is what represents who they are as an artist and I want to like see what that is so I think it's you know it can be daunting because you know there are a, you may be trying to like put feelers out to a lot of people and everything but um, it's really worth putting in that time to just like research who you're sending stuff to and sending it to the right people and putting time into thinking about what it is you want to send and then just be friendly and just you know the people i tend to be most responsive to uh, and more eager to listen to are the ones who approach me in a very sort of human way and are just like i saw you're like you know doing this and this and this like i kind of felt like maybe my music might fit there like can i send you a link to listen to some stuff and then i'll be like yeah, like send me a couple tracks and someone sends it and I'll make the time to go listen. Um, so, you know, the personal touch really is, is worth it. And, and then also just be patient, just be realistic. Something that I've started doing more recently is setting aside like an hour or two once a week where I'm actually just pulling up like a folder of like links that people have sent me and I'll start trying to listen through and respond to people. Um, but unfortunately I can't always like, do that every single day or anything like that so like just be patient and you know wait a little bit of, of time like a week or two you can always follow up but uh, you know yeah don't be too persistent but persistence is okay <laughs>
I'm, I'm curious about your guys' process of discovery. Where are you discovering new music? Where are you getting, what's your resource of finding new artists? And also, um, hypothetically, you're given the instruction of you need to work on this project. It needs a lot of Swedish music, whatever, Swedish pop music or whatever. Just say that Sweden is your directive. How, what's your first person that you're gonna call to be like, who, who do you know in Sweden? that does the best music? Like, just talk a little bit about your network and process of discovery. I'll, I'll jump in and I'll, I'll just kind of piggyback because I don't think we answered one question from before, which was about pre-cleared music. Oh, yeah. Um, that's always, always, always super helpful. If, if, there's, if there's a song that we know that we can clear right away, um, oftentimes there's, song, there's uh, scenes, you know, for, for television uh, where you need to find an alt very quickly, or it, it's been decided at the last minute that they want to have a song in a particular scene. Um, and so you need some options that you know that you can clear within a matter of, uh, of a day, if not hours. And so to be able to, to be presented with music that is pretty clear, that's like an A plus, you know, on <clears throat> for me, it's super helpful. And um, I tend to, to, to be a repeat shopper, you know, with uh, companies like that. If I know that I can clear, you know, a song right away with no issues and the music is good, it's quality, I tend to go back. So um, just to go to back to that question, that that is uh, super, super helpful. So both sides, you know, if all the writers are in agreement or if it's just one writer, it's it's super, super good for us. Yeah. And on this and on the representation side, I mean, that would be a very early conversation because anything that, for instance, I would be ingesting into my catalog I would have to know exactly what I represent. Ideally, it's just 100% on both sides, but you know, maybe there's a co-writer on something then I'm gonna go and like probably connect with that writer or that if they have a publisher, then their publisher and like make sure that we're on the same page that if we're both pitching this, we're both agreeing that we're not gonna complicate the clearance process and you essentially can, you know, it's not going to be quote unquote like one stop or something like that, but we would probably call it just easy clear and just, you know, then Yvette, for instance, would know that, you know, she sees two different publishers listed, but, you know, there aren't going to be any issues if it's a quick turnaround and people are on the same page about getting this thing licensed. So. Do you want to, you want to hit that other question? Uh, sure. I, um, I, I honestly like, uh, don't <laughs> I don't feel like I'm like the best like music discoverer um, funnily enough like my fiance is actually like an amazing music discoverer and I like actually discover a lot of really cool music from him but uh, more recently there's I think like I really love discovering really interesting new like composers and composer artists again that's, that's a world that I've like worked in a lot um, and uh so like, I think like for me, Instagram has been like a really cool resource and I just, you know, I follow certain artists I really like and then I'll see them tag people they're collaborating with and I'm like, oh, who is this? I haven't seen this name before and I'll like go down a rabbit hole on someone's website listening to music and stuff like that. So that's kind of been my way right now. And then also there's this new like socializing app. I don't know what they're calling it called Clubhouse that I've now been on for a couple months and I jump in and I like to chat on some of the like sync chats on there and then people will follow me or will like send me DMs on Instagram and like send me music or things like that. Um, and I've been kind of actually enjoying just kind of like, like I said, taking some time once a week to just go back through those messages and try and like listen to some stuff and respond to people. Um, and uh, I've connected with some really interesting artists that way, actually. Um, so that's been kind of fun. Um, but I think those are right now, like my two main ways um, of finding interesting people. And then sometimes just people reaching out, uh, but yeah. So Abel, you're also totally cool if people uh, uh, contact you via social media. It doesn't have to be an official email. It could be Instagram or Facebook Messenger or whatever there yeah. is. Or do you have like a preference as far as business etiquette you know I think I uh I think just everything's been changing a lot and more recently I've embraced stuff like Instagram I still for some reason for me 
Uh, like LinkedIn is a place that some people send me stuff. I'm not a huge fan of just LinkedIn as like an interface. It is really weird, uh, but I don't I don't mind it too much uh, because it is sort of like a professional site. So like that's kind of where it should be happening. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I I don't I don't mind it too much on Instagram. Again, I I would just say like be patient. First of all, if I'm not following you and you send a message, it's going to go into that like message requests box. So like it's kind of in a little bit of a hidden place. Um, but yeah, I think it's also just, you know, uh, I'm getting a bit more and more, I don't want to make it sound like I'm getting like hundreds of <laughs> messages by any means, but like, you know, if I'm getting a few every week. I try to set aside time to go back later and, and listen to them. But, um, I'm for some reason still like really not a fan of people reaching out on Facebook. I still see Facebook as this place, even though I'm like using it less and less, like I still see it as this place. That's kind of like my personal life. And I've started getting people trying to just at friend request me that I've never met before on there, or they'll maybe send a message. And to me, that still feels like weird. Um, but I am like, I'm in the process of like, my company's very new. So I'm still in the process of building my website, but I am building a, a submission form on there. Um, and so I am creating some ways that people will be able to, to send over music for consideration for representation. So, um, yeah. And I have a lot of much better insight. <laughs> yeah, well, for me, you're you're totally making me like think about things because um, I have been like a social media phobe, and so I don't really have uh, accounts on you know Instagram or Twitter. But I, I know that that needs to change because I you know it's just a new way for people to interact and not just personally but professionally. Um, and I've heard of Clubhouse too, so you're like fifth person who's like mentioned it like the last week so um I guess that's another another avenue um I you know I as far as me discovering music you know I still kind of go to to band camp um I read you know a lot of the blogs still pitchfork um and I'm on spotify quite often um and so, and then certainly, you know, the music that I'm getting from my colleagues, you know, when they're, they're reaching out and they say, hey, we just signed a new artist. And, you know, so that's really important for me too. And so again, my priority is to at least start with my, my colleagues whose job is to search for, you know, those interesting artists. So when they do, you know, approach me with, with someone that they're excited about, I'll certainly listen you know, to, to the music. And, um, so I, that's definitely a, another resource for me. Um, uh, yeah, as far as contacting, you know, I think email is still kind of the way to go for now. <laughs> and I'm also, again, because I'm starting in the middle of starting my company, you know, I, I will also have a, a web page that will be dedicated for people to be able to reach out that way too. Um, but I, I think patience is, is very important because again, you know, I'm, I'm usually listening to music throughout the day for work, specifically for specific tasks. And so the idea of casual listening, um, becomes shorter and shorter, uh, an opportunity. So I do have to kind of carve out some space for, for, uh, music that's just kind of sent to me, uh, on a general a general level. Um, and but I, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say the, the, the follow-up question I really had for you guys is like, say you're given the directive of you have to find Swedish based music, like who are, who are the people that you're calling or where, where are you going as your first resource to, to access, um, you know, whether, like I said, whether it's Swedish pop, Nordic classical, or, you know, there's a partner that's a public that is like, a, you know, contributing money and you have to license music from Sweden as like a hypothetical situation. I'm just curious, what, what are the roads that you guys go on to, to find and access that sort of music? Well, I, I will say um, in, in, in a general sense, you know, if I'm looking for specifically ethnic uh, music, um, I usually prepare a creative brief where, you know, I outline specifically what I'm looking for, um, the, the country of origin, the time period, um, and I reach out to, to several colleagues and just say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Can you send me what you have um, within these parameters? And there's some folks that they specialize, you know, with working with um, 
you know, Swedish artists or, you know, artists from European countries. Um, so I usually go that route. And then I, I will also investigate on my end. Like I'll hit up, I'll go on Spotify um, or so, some, some uh, international blogs and just see like, you know, who's interesting to start listening to music that way. Um, as far as like a specific uh, entity that I would go to specifically for Swedish music, uh, that's kind of why I'm here. So hopefully uh, I will, <laughs> after, uh, after our, our conversation today, maybe I'll have some new uh, resources to, to reach out to. Great. Uh, before, uh, I want to talk a bit uh, about what uh, Abel said earlier also about, you know, uh, COVID and how it's changing our industry. I just want to, before we do that, uh, A, you know, I want to point out the importance also to claim your Spotify artist page if you haven't done so, because Yvette just said, you know, what an important tool that is. And Chandler can also put the, if you don't know the URL for claiming your artist page, you can put that in the chat. And Abel, quickly, just a follow-up question before we go into, into COVID. Uh, can you just quickly say, what does pre-cleared music mean? Does that mean having 100% ownership over the music? It, that, that's a question that came from the chat room. Can you quickly explain what pre-cleared means? Yeah, I mean, um, it's basically, you know, you just want to make sure that uh, the music is going to be able to clear quickly if, uh, for instance, Yvette reaches out with a license request. So it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you have full ownership of it. Um, it just needs to, to mean that all parties involved are on the same page, that things are going to move forward without any issue. Um, that also, you know, something I think that Yvette touched on earlier, like in the first question, is um, like if you're doing any kind of sampling and you want to make sure that any samples are cleared because you know you might think you own you know 100 of the publishing and master on your track, but then you sampled you used a sample in there, but you didn't clear that sample, so you actually don't own that 100, and that's going to cause a lot of trouble down the road. And especially if you're misrepresenting it as fully cleared, that's going to be a big headache for someone like Yvette when suddenly like people are calling the network or the studio or whatever the production company and saying like what the heck my like you know sample is used in this track that you cleared but we didn't license this like or what you know so you just really want to make things as seamless as possible and again like Yvette kind of said she's going to keep going back to people who are really easy and seamless to license music with who also have like a lot of great music but you know that that process I mean you know, it's complicated as it is, um, and especially for, you know, uh, if Yvette comes to me to license a track for a TV show for an episode that she's working on, it's like one song for like one moment in one episode of an entire series. So she's like clearing all kinds of stuff with all kinds of different people. And like, I don't want to be the one that ends up like taking up all of her time and like complicating things and giving her a headache when she's like, I have like three more episodes coming that each have like 10 tracks of music that I have to clear in them. Why am I still stuck on clearing this piece of music here or whatever, you know? So I think, you know, just trying to always make the process uh, as easy and seamless as possible. And that's, that's also where relationships come in because if we do have to have a conversation about the fee or something like that, you know, it's much better if Yvette knows she can pick up the phone and call me and just be like, can we talk about this? Or I can call her and just say, Hey, like, can we bump this up a little bit and she can be very honest about what the budget is she's working with or whatever, you know, or we can maybe discuss the terms or something, but it can be just like a quick conversation where we can just understand what it is. And then it can be just like a great, we're good to move forward or like, sorry, we can't make this happen. And then she can move on to just replacing the track with the next one in line or something like that. But ideally that's not what happens. <laughs> it just ends up being a seamless go ahead. But, um, but yeah, so, so it's just really important to make sure that your music, so even if you're, if you're talking to someone and you're like, I own this master and I own 50% of the publishing, um, I don't have a relationship with the publisher of the other 50%, but here's who it is, or here's who the writer is, or whatever, you know, even if you can at least just be very upfront, very honest about what the situation is, someone else maybe can potentially help you figure out the rest or the missing piece, or even just at least knowing we have to go and do that as part of it 
you know, it, it's better than than hiding something and then finding out down the road when it's in the final cut that like it's going to be a complicated clearance. Like, I'll probably never get a call from that person again <laughs> to like work with if I'm like making it really difficult to license the music. So. Uh, can you quickly talk because you know it, uh, how if the pandemic if COVID uh, over the last uh, year uh, has changed the licensing market in the United States and if you also foresee you know what your forecast is for 21 also in that sense if if the industry is changing and uh, what to expect there. I think it's I think it's in the process of working itself out. I think we probably won't know that answer definitively for you know a few months. There's this this kind of gray area now with with television versus film, where you have like you know Netflix that's releasing that's creating um, a, a film that ordinarily would be you know would have a that theatrical release, but now it's being released you know on television style platforms. Um, and in that regard, that would have, that one would anticipate that that will affect the rights language that we're, we're dealing with. Maybe not, um, but I think it's all still kind of up in the air right now. Um, U.S. productions are slowly coming, coming back. There have been a couple that uh, have been based here in Los Angeles that have extended the delay of filming by about two weeks just because we've been hit pretty hard here uh, with COVID. Um, There's literally a, like an ABC pilot shooting on my street right now. <laughs> oh God! Well, it's it's hopefully they're safe. It's, um, they're yeah, safe. I know. <laughs> it's like <laughs> so. It is. It is slowly coming back here. I think you know. Obviously, you know, for the last nine plus months, um, it it was kind of a desert. There wasn't much happening. Um, I was very fortunate where um, two shows that I was working on over the summer were produced by the same company, the same studio that uh, were filming on set um, where there was also housing on set. And so everyone was tested, the crew was tested, the cast was tested, and if, if they were all negative, then they were all quarantined on set for however long they were shooting. So no one was able to kind of come and go. They were all basically sequestered there. So in that sense, production could keep, keep rolling you know, for, for several months. But that's rare. Um, everyone else certainly, you know, shut down. But like I said, there's there's like a flurry of activity that's happening now. So I think, you know, placements will start picking up again um, uh, in the next uh, several months. I, I, it seems to me that the only thing that would be a few other things that are affected, which probably are not applicable to this conversation, but um, uh, on camera performances, you know, where, where an actor would have to sing. Um, there's just new guidelines now um, and recording sessions. There's new guidelines for recording sessions. Who can be a part of that session? You know, they're limiting the number of people in a certain, you know, recording studio. Um, so those things have been affected by, by COVID. Yeah, I would say on my end, um, you know, it was definitely very interesting going through last year. Uh, back in March, uh, we really like braced ourselves for this like abrupt halt. And it did happen for about like a week and a half, two weeks. And then suddenly, you know, ad agencies started reaching out um, and everybody was doing their like sentimental COVID spots and unity spots and all of that. And then that turned into more like positive like stuff. And um, so, I mean, I think, uh, a lot of it's weird it's like uh, I think things in some senses slowed down but almost like in a good way where like we could have some breathing room in between things um but at the same time like business is still happening um especially sort of in the advertising sector the trailer space was a very interesting one because you can't really create trailers if production stops shooting so there was like a period of finishing off trailers for anything that's already gone into post-production or already had shot some footage. Then they started getting creative with how they might be able to piece something together to create. But then also a lot of the trailer houses um, started working a lot on trailers for different TV series for the streaming platforms and everything. And that's really kept that world um, going. So it has still remained fairly continuous on that front. Um, I think one of the 
bigger things to be affected in a lot of ways is the fees. So that's kind of what I was touching on before, whereas like normally there's like a lot more money, I think in the US, but, um, and not to say that like they've gone away or anything like that, but there have been areas where like fees have to come down and people talk about things like COVID pricing and are trying to make sure that like, okay, once we bounce back and things all go back into full swing, like we need to go back up to what we were charging for stuff like we can't suddenly now diminish the the cost of music and stuff so it's going to be very interesting to see how everything kind of like ramps back up um, and everything but it has still remained somewhat continuous overall in the sync space and i, I would say just to piggyback uh on that uh, and i know we're, we're tight on time i i haven't seen budgets change so much you know as far as tv sync so maybe you know maybe we'll be in a good, good place you know <laughs> when it's all said and done you know cer certainly for the projects i'm on it, it feels pretty standard as it has been in the last you know several years thanks to Yvette and arbel and i'm going to give it back to chester ah thank you so much thomas thanks for great moderating and send, send our regards to chander too and thanks to Yvette for and arbel for being with us tonight and thanks everybody that was listening it was almost 90 people that's great oh. And, uh, I'm glad I could only see like 12 of them. <laughs> yeah, it was actually only 12. No, it was almost nice. Uh, so you guys should have a great day today and the rest of us have a pleasant evening, I hope. And I can't wait to come over again with a delegation. To yes. Yeah, I hope yeah, to see absolutely. you this year. That we, uh, that's, it, it was great virtually this year, but it is different being here in Los Angeles and welcoming everyone and, you know, the personal contact and, and showing yeah. people around and having a beer together, you know. <laughs> yeah.